Okay, we are go live. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, I do think we're missing a few advisory group members, so I, I'll just hold for a minute, um, but we have started streaming this live for the community to watch if they choose to. All right, now they're all coming in. How are you, Erica? I hope you had a good holiday. Hey, you too. Thanks. All right, good evening, everybody. So we'll um, get started. Looks like we have most of the group here. I uh, appreciate you all taking the time tonight to have our advisory group meeting so we could provide you an update with the project. Um, a little while ago, I sent you out the slides that we'll be going through tonight, but in general, we're going to give you a project slash budget update. Um, we're gonna go through some minor design updates um, and then we will uh, go through a construction update. And we have our um, Skanska, our uh, construction management team is here uh, to introduce themselves and uh, present some of the information about what's going on over the next couple of months. I wanna let everybody know um, for those viewing and those who are panelists, this is being recorded um, it's also being streamed live um, and all of your videos are visible um, whether you're speaking or not to the public. So just keep that in mind. Please make sure you're muted if you're not speaking. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Erica Lehman, if you could please share the screen. So we could go through the PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Well, first, I hope you all had a great uh, Thanksgiving holiday. I'm sure, um, like for me, I stayed here and didn't go to Chicago or New Jersey, um, or which, which are my two places. Uh, I'm sure it was the same for a lot of you, but I hope you had a good holiday um, and able to enjoy it with at least some of your family. Um, like I said, we wanted to provide you an update. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so I went through this agenda, but just going through the project update, a design, uh, Erica Lehman from DLR Group will present a design update. Um, Joe Kyfus with Skanska will talk about some of the pre-construction activities that we'll have going on over the next couple of months and what that'll look like. Um, and then we're going to do round robin comments. So similar to how we've done uh, some of the past advisory group meetings, I'll just go down the list and anybody, um, everybody will have a chance to uh, ask any questions. Um, or provide any comments. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Want to give an update on the budget and the schedule. We know uh, last time we talked, I think was in August. And then in September, we had um, the hearing. And at that time, um, the, we, the ACPS issued a memo just uh, stating where we were with the budget at that time. We have since, that, since then been able to um, make some reductions that have uh, significantly reduced that funding gap um, by about three to four million to now a potential funding gap of two to four million. Um, and that's many thanks to uh, our, our project team, as well as Skanska and DLR group um, for being innovative and in how we're able to do that. And um, Erica will walk through a little bit of what we were able to do. Um, we have requested in our CIP an additional $2 million, which is really to fund the city requirements um, including undergrounding utilities and the purchase of solar panels, which if you'll recall, were not an original component of this project. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we're continuing through these next few months as we finalize uh, the, the drawings and um, get ready for construction to continue to see reductions um, and, and uh, fully confident that we'll be able to build this um, within budget. 
as far as the schedule, we're providing you this update tonight. We have a community meeting scheduled for next Monday, uh, which you're also welcome to be a part of. It will also, it will be a webinar format so people can submit questions um, and we can answer them live at that meeting. Uh, as far as construction, I know people are eager and wanting to know when something will actually happen and when, you, when you'll be able to see it. Um, we are still waiting on one final uh, utility disconnect for Dominion, um, and we're hoping that'll happen fairly soon. And then we'll, um, we'll be going through our demolition process and permitting, um, as well as the contract, which Scansco will talk a little bit about later. We can go to the next slide. Um, so design update, I'll just kick this off and turn it over to Erica Lehman. So some of the adjustments that we've made uh, since the last time we've talked, um, including for the budget constraints that we have, we did remove some extended learning area in the building. So these are areas um, in the hallways um, and adjacent to classrooms for really pull out for um, just a, a different place for learning to happen. Um, we've been able to maintain some of them. Uh, but we did reduce them um, in order to get some square footage savings out of the building. We also removed the community room. So we had originally proposed a room that would be accessible um, basically during school hours for the community or civic associations or parent groups um, to use. We did remove that room. It's important to note though, that we'll continue to um, be in, in partnership with all of our community and our neighbors and that um, our, our spaces will be uh, open for, uh, for facility use by other community groups um, after school hours. Um, we've also, that first bullet, the east side field adjustments, we've been working very closely with the neighbors uh, directly east of Douglas MacArthur. In particular, for those of you who live in the area, you understand the grade changes um, are, can be very drastic. And so, um, Erica will talk through a little bit of what we've been able to do there. And I think we've had some success in um, being able to meet our needs, but also to be um, responsive to our neighbors. Uh, and then we'll talk just briefly about some of the interior uh, layout progress. So with that, I will turn it over to Erica Lehman and she can walk through more details. Thanks, Erica. So um, as Erica was just mentioning, we've been working on the site planning as we're finalizing and um, uh, getting ready to submit or have submitted our final site plan um, to the city. But one of the key areas that we were focused on was the area uh, to the adjacent uh, neighbors on the east side. So um, I put this up because this is uh, the previous version of the site plan where we were. So you can see up here in this northeast corner uh, that playing field was uh, pretty closely adjacent to those to those neighbors as well as, as at a different elevation, uh, different grade level. So um, we, we had several meetings with them and sorry, I don't have a pretty version of this now, but um, just wanted to put this up so that you all could see what we did, which is um, essentially we kept, the, we kept the size of the field as it was, as well as the size of the sidewalks as they were. We just reduced what's called the run out. So the extra space on the outside of the field lines got a little bit shorter. Um, and we shifted some things around to pull the field a little bit away from those adjacent properties, um, as well as we lowered the level of the field down a little bit. So we will still have a, a fully accessible field. Uh, there's a pathway that you can take out of the building and around to get onto the field, as well as then a couple of steps. Um, so this pathway to the south will be on level, you know, accessible pathway. And then up here, which looks like just some black lines here, but this scale, but this will be um, a, um, a couple of steps that come down. So the field will sit down a little bit lower than the adjacent sidewalk, which as you, go, as you all probably recall is where also we have our fire lane coming through on that end. Um, the other thing that we did, and this was partially in response to the school and sort of request about making this pathway around the field feeling a little more rounded or a little more uh, uh, like a like a track where the kids would practice, uh, you know, sort of girls on the run, that sort of thing. So we chamfered those corners and that's allowing us to maintain a wider gap between our field level and the adjacent neighbors. Um, what you're not seeing on this drawing is then we will be in backfilling that with some uh, some evergreen trees similar to the evergreens that already exist along the property line. We'll be planting uh, uh, additional evergreens in this gap 
uh, which will also help screen, um, screen the neighbors uh, between the site and the adjacent property neighbors. Um, as it turns out, as we uh, worked through this elevation, uh, we were just sitting up uh, higher, higher than we wanted to be relative to the neighbor's fences. So we've kind of pushed that field level down. Um, and I think it was actually a really cooperative um, communication between the neighbors and the school and a lot of people willing to kind of negotiate back and forth to get us to a point where I think everybody will be um, happy with the, with the end result. Um, and, and actually it allowed us to eliminate some retaining wall on the site by doing that as well. So um, that's really the biggest uh, site plan update. No other major changes since the last time, uh, the last time we talked. Um, I will, for some reason, I skipped a level. Okay, wait a minute. It, it wasn't in the deck. Oh, geez. Okay, so yeah, I was curious about that. Floor plan. Uh oh, sorry guys. It looks like a slide got deleted. Um, let me see. Um, uh, all right. I'm going to go off the rails here for a second. I'm going to stop sharing and see if I can pull it up from another presentation. Sorry, everyone. Um, uh, we somehow lost a slide here. Um, That's not the right one. Now I feel like everybody's staring at me. <laughs> Where is it? Shoot. Erica, you're doing a great job, don't you? Sorry. Don't you work. <laughs> oh, don't Lord. You work. Um, I'm, I'm still cooking my soup here, so don't you okay. worry. Okay, thanks, job. Sister Jeter. Appreciate it. Uh, I will. Unfortunately, at these moments, then the network is going to be slow trying to open these big files. So um, you want to just keep all right. going? There we go. So I'll, I, I've got it here. I'll share this one. Um, and then maybe we'll just update it and what we're sending out. So um, is everybody seeing that screen now with the first floor plan? Erica, can yeah. you make it full size? Yes. Yeah, um, there we go. Is that, is that working? Looks great. Okay, yep. great. Okay, so this is the first floor plan, <laughs> sorry. So um, we've, we've made a few changes that Erica Gulick was mentioning. Um, and I wanted to just clarify that the spaces that are here in yellow are the extended learning areas. And some of you may recall that we had a secondary extended learning area on each level of each of the three levels going up through the building. Um, and as we ran through all of our numbers and started evaluating costs and ways to save money, we realized that we had more extended learning area in the program than was called for in the program. So while we did eliminate those, which essentially we took the, the, the yellow um, swath that was going through the building, we kind of cut that out and, and squished the building uh, together along this back bar of the building. Um, we took that out, but we aren't less than what was called for in the ed spec. So I just wanted everybody to be clear, while we did reduce square footage in the building, we didn't take away from program that was already a part of the original program. Um, so that was how we approached re some reductions on the, um, on the academic bar. And then on the front portion of the building, the Southern portion of the building, um, as Erica had mentioned, we had the community room and a couple of office support spaces uh, down here in the corner that I'm kind of pointing to now. And we did a very similar thing there, which was basically take those rooms away and reconfigure the administrative and athletic support spaces 
and squish them together. So the end result of all of that is that this end of the building towards the east has has moved over approximately 16 feet on both the northern wing and the southern wing. Um, and the reason that we did it that way is that the items on the western side of the site, so the access to the parking garage, the parent drop-off, et cetera, those are sort of very given fixed dimensions that were already set and already functional. Um, we really couldn't gain anything beneficial by adding more space on that side. What we, what we do gain is some additional play space by going ahead and taking that out of the Eastern side. So by moving the gym over, we, we've gained a little bit of additional paved play area um, and given ourselves a little bit more space around the, around the playing field. So that's, what, um, that's why we decided to make that change in that direction. So um, those, were the, those were the biggest reductions that we took um, in terms of square footage um, on a cost savings um, basis. Another thing that some of you might notice, those who have sort of the keen eye for um, for these drawings, um, we had had a staircase that ran um, from the first floor up to the second floor. And then you'll see as we go to the other floors, and then it was a discontinuous staircase that ran through the building first to second, and then second to third in a different location. We have actually changed that now so that, that the staircase that I'm circling here um, actually connects uh, through all the floors and down to the parking garage level, as well as up through the classroom levels. Um, that was just uh, twofold uh, sort of reasoning for doing that. One was um, a more economical uh, stair situation where we have it all stacked together, but also from a code compliance point of view, uh, we were not able to meet code with the, with the stair configuration that we had previously. Um, because of the number of students that are up on the third floor. So we, uh, we needed to do a reconfiguration there. So it was just a, a sort of double cost benefit as well as code, code necessity. Um, and so then I'm gonna, sorry, go back to where we were. And we'll, we'll get this, uh, corrected and um, get us back to the to the right PowerPoint here. So teach me to have this many PowerPoints open in my computer at one time. Okay, let's get us back. Okay, so then are you guys seeing that full screen again? Yes. Um, okay, so then um, this is where I was talking about this stair that we did not previously have extending up through the second and third floor. That stair will now connect all three levels. So we have appropriate egress there. Um, so uh, the configuration of the second floor stayed um, largely as you last have seen it. Some of you, again, who are, have a keener eye may, may notice some changes down here in the special education wing. We've been working with that team to make sure that we're accommodating um, that self-contained program that will be on, on campus here. So um, that's, that's probably the biggest changes that you might see um, on, the, on the second floor. And then the third floor, uh, really what the end result of the change that we made in terms of trying to reduce area of the building um, in this floor really just resulted in a slightly smaller um, outdoor rooftop area here. Um, other than that, uh, you know, taking away that, that extended learning area that was down here. But again, because we have extended learning areas here and here we still um, have a nice balance of extended learning areas on the third floor. Um, and then from a design point of view, um, and this is, I think, the same as the last time we all talked to you. So um, 
we've been working on the building exterior, um, partly from a cost point of view, but also um, from a solar analysis point of view. So one of the things that you'll notice in uh, in this gym elevation is that you, you'll see we have some windows uh, here facing the south, as well as an additional window here facing east. As we were doing our solar studies, uh, we really felt we needed some additional glazing um, coming into the gym to give us our, our proper daylighting in the gym. That will help us run the building lighting as little as possible. Um, so that's been the sort of main driver of some of the elevational changes that you've seen on the, um, on the gym area of the building um, and just a few different uh, views of that. Um, and then you're see, seeing that here from the, um, from the Southwest side. Um, so that's, that's what's really been driving the, the design changes that we've been making on the exterior of the building is really, uh, really mostly driven by uh, by solar, a little bit by cost. So we do have some design alternates that we're considering, and I'll show you those uh, later. Um, and then on the back of the building, um, as we reduced the the length of that north uh, corridor wing, we did make some design changes here on this north elevation, but still very very similar and consistent. Um, approach really trying to, you know, I think if you're not really super uh, into the details of the building, probably most people wouldn't, wouldn't notice significant you know, changes having happened unless they're looking at them adjacent to each other. Um, so as I mentioned, we do have some, some alternates. So um, one of the ways that we sort of deal with the somewhat you know, sometimes volatile construction market is to put alternates into a project. So uh, we have two um, two major alternates that we have here and we'll likely have, uh, you know, a couple of other smaller alternates through the course of the project that might have to do with interior finish materials and things like that. Um, but the two bigger alternates that we're looking at here are uh, parking garage reduction um, and then a turf uh, turf field in a natural field instead of a synthetic turf field. Um, so as you know, as Erica wrote here, we'll, we'll avoid it if we can, uh, but if we have to, we will um, we'll have to look at taking these reductions. So in terms of the parking garage reduction, um, you'll see we have in the left-hand side here, the larger, the larger layout we've done really a lot of work here to make sure that this parking garage is as efficient as it could possibly be under the building. So that gets us to the 80 some parking spaces. Uh, but if we have to, um, on the right hand side, this smaller reduced footprint is what's required by code. So um, if we have to take a reduction, we would reduce down to the code required um, 50, it's a total of 57 spaces, 52 spaces below grade and the five spaces above grade. Um, and then one of the other alternates that we have is the canopy. So, um, you know, we would love to see, you know, a, a more robust canopy that connects down towards the, towards the bus drop off and really um, kind of creates this sense of entry to the building, but, you know, cost being an important driver, we will, um, you know, we'll consider um, that, uh, consider cost. And if, if prices come in on bid day and they, everything's looking great, uh, we would love to see this happen. But um, I will say, um, and, and Erica can jump in if I'm wrong, but I have a feeling we'll build parking spots before we build canopy. Um, so there will be sort of a layered approach um, to how um, any alternates are, are selected. Erica, if there, let me know if there's anything yeah, else I, just, I should say I just there. Really wanna, uh, just to talk about the parking garage, because that is um, an absolute last resort for us and really uh, not something we are looking to pursue at all. So that will definitely be um, the last alternate to go through if need be. We are really hoping and pretty confident that we'll be able to um, afford the full parking garage. Um, there's been some questions in the chat and we'll certainly answer those at the end about 
um, some more of the specifics, but um, yes, the parking garage would certainly come before the canopy um, as well as the turf and other things. Um, and so uh, again, just needing to have alternates included um, because of just some of the budget constraints, we wanna make sure that the project is able to move forward. Um, but certainly it's, it's not, a, not something we are looking or planning on pursuing. All right, I think we turn it over to Joe here. Oh, good, so good afternoon, everyone. I am Joe Kaifas, project manager uh, with Skanska Construction. Um, myself uh, and Eric Henson should be on the line representing Skanska tonight. Um, we were brought on board, I think this is the first time I'm meeting uh, most of you uh, virtually, of course. Um, brought on board earlier this year um, to assist uh, the, the team, DLR and ACPS, um, with kind of cost evaluation and estimating uh, throughout these uh, throughout this past year. Um, so very pleased to be here, excited. Uh, looks like it's gonna be a great project. Um, as you can see on the screen right now, we're currently working with ACPS um, to secure the contract for the construction. We were brought on from a pre-construction perspective and trying to secure the contract for the construction activities. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the preliminary activities uh, that you're likely gonna see here in the first couple months um, of 2021, and then we're looking at actual demolition starting in early 2021. Um, so Eric, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so I've kind of broke it down into three different categories. Pre-mobilization, um, we anticipate this being anywhere from, you know, half a month to one, one and a half months. So uh, currently as it stands right now, we're looking for a contract and those to proceed uh, in December timeframe of 2020. I think that aligns with a lot of the um, uh, board and council approval need to occur. Um, once we receive um, that notice to proceed, we will then immediately submit our hazmat abatement permit to the city. Once that paint, uh, permit is secured, we're, it's generally required 20 days uh, that has to be posted before any abatement work can occur on the site. Um, so that's gonna be an important thing to note. Um, during that time frame, that kind of law of that 20 days, we'll be, we will develop and submit our road of control plan to the city. They'll need to review and approve it. And then upon the approval, we'll implement. Um, also during this pre-mobilization -pre activity, uh, we will uh, start an existing condition surveys, um, pending coordination of the adjacent homeowners. Um, I'm assuming that ACPS and DLR have reached out to possibly get those scheduled. We can talk about the timelines associated with that. Uh, the other item we're gonna be uh, tracking during that time frame, and Erica Gulick mentioned earlier, are the utility disconnects, the typical gas, water, electric, telecom, sanitary, and storm uh, that need to happen at both properties, 1101 and 1201. Uh, Jannies. Um, and then the anticipated work hours uh, are Monday through Friday, 7 to 6, and Saturday, 9 to 6. Again, that's what's uh, allowable, um, but we don't expect to unless need to uh, for acceleration to work those hours. So it'll be a pretty typical construction day. But again, once we get into it, um, we can maybe uh, have a little bit more finite conversation about that. Um, would you mind jumping to the next slide? Uh, so the next activity that would occur is hazmat abatement. Um, generally, the work uh, for this is, is expected to take one to two months. Um, there's some uncertainty with that about the material that we may or may not find. An initial assessment was done, but once we get into it, you, you're likely to uncover some additional material that needs to be abated and disposed of. Um, during that, this upfront uh, initial mobilization, we will secure uh, the site with perimeter fencing. Um, parking lot, playground, and trail entrances at Douglas MacArthur will no longer be accessible once this is done, I just want to make a note because that's always one thing. Uh, the couple of times I've been out there, the community is still using uh, the playgrounds and the spaces, uh, which is great. But once we obviously start construction and hazmat abatement, the entire perimeter uh, will be secured and no other uh, uh, individuals will be able to access it. Um, during this initial mobilization, we'll start you know, mobilizing our general requirement items, our dumpsters, our temporary restrooms, signage, proper PPE, generators for construction and our typical construction entrances. Uh, we'll also uh, do some salvaging of existing memorabilia and plaques. Um, again, back to the road of control plan. This is when it would be implemented. Uh, we can maybe talk a little bit more about that um, once we finish up as part of the Q&A. Um, during this time frame, we will also be uh, um, removing building contents, kind of a soft strip, meaning any loose material, furniture, cabinets, things that can come out and be uh, removed prior to abatement. And then we will start the abatement um, of the building, which will uh, be done obviously in accordance with code 
uh, and the industrial hygienist that'll be on board overseeing from like a third party perspective uh, and documenting everything. Um, any hazardous building contents will obviously be uh, removed in accordance uh, with code requirements and then um, disposed of uh, accordingly. Um, and then we will also establish erosion and sediment control measures during this time frame, and then submit our demolition permit and supporting documentation to take us on to the next phase. Maybe jump to the next slide. And then the actual demolition uh, physical building coming down on site, uh, we expect that to take about two months once it starts. Um, there's a permit process that we need to go through. Uh, once we receive that permit, then we'll start the demolition, continue on with the soft strip, um, re-inspect our erosion sediment control measures, because this is when you're going to start to see a lot of heavy activity going on on site. This will include kind of the demolition of the trees, the fields, uh, playground equipment, et cetera. And then we will establish our dust mitigation measures, uh, which are um, basically localized water can cannons or fire hoses to keep all the dust to a minimum uh, on the site as we start to uh, crush and process material. Um, the material itself will be salvaged. That which we can, like concrete metals, will be uh, separated and sorted off to the side. And then debris that actually has to go to a landfill, like insulation and woods, will obviously be sorted and uh, managed separately. Um, the big, big item that always, from a demolition standpoint, that um, we probably want to talk a little bit more about is actually the removal of the building slab and foundation system. This activity in particular is usually the most invasive uh, that we're going to have to deal with during the demolition time frame. So um, what they're going to do is they'll bring in like a hydraulic hammer and break the bigger foundations into smaller units. And that's uh, what most people custom uh, or, or assimilate to demolition activities going on. You hear that hammer. Uh, tapping and pinging, and that, that's kind of when this activity is going to be occurring. That's, like I say, the most invasive portion that we're likely going to have to deal with during these first uh, three, four, five months of the project. Um, once those are out, we'll continue on with our uh, utility removal cut cap um, of the utilities. There's a few uh, utilities that need to be grouted and then abandoned in place. Um, then we'll establish the erosion sediment control measures for the next phase, which is kind of the mass excavation of the parking structure. And then that particular aspect requires a, uh, a special permit or, or a particular permit that is not included uh, in, the, uh, in the demolition activity. So that's kind of where the next phase of permits kind of start. So I, I apologize kind of running through that real quick, but that's a real broad brush stroke of what's going to be going on over the next, uh, next four or five months um, at the site. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, so we've gotten a few questions in the chat. I want to go ahead and try and answer them before uh, we turn it over to different advisory group members um, to see what they want to say. Um, and OK, so the first one, um, Erica, I'm going to ask you if you could look this one up while I answer some of the other ones. But the actual total square foot reduction of the um, community room and the extended learning areas. Um, I'm going to go ahead and answer the how many staff are in the building. Um, we currently have about 75 full time staff in the building. Mm -hmm. um, I believe this relates to another uh, question, but I believe there are about 65, maybe 66 parking spaces on the current site. Um, with the increased enrollment, we would expect probably somewhere around 85 um, to 90 full time staff uh, on that site. So certainly. Uh, for parking, that is a consideration. I would note that we are adding uh, street parking um, that doesn't exist currently on the north side of Janney's Lane. Uh, however, like I said, we um, don't plan on, it is not our, our hope, um, and we're going to make every effort to avoid having to reduce that parking garage. Um, cost savings for the garage and for the turf, I believe, and Joe or Paul, someone can correct me, um, but I believe the garage was somewhere around 1.5 million and the turf was somewhere around half a million. I want to just let the community know too, um, because we're still in negotiations on these prices and this final contract, we can't share um, so much information, but right now that's about I believe the savings we would expect from either of those alternates. Joe, were you going to say something? Am I right? No, no I was. I'm trying to look it up to get the okay. number, but I think you're generally right on on those uh, ranges. Yeah. 
So, and Erica, to answer that earlier question, I can't actually look things up while I'm sharing the screen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, just my rough numbers calculating here in front of me, I think it's around 3,200. So somewhere between 32 and 3,500 square feet we saved in those two program reductions. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. And then just to explain that shift, basically the um, east side of the building moved west. Uh, so extended kind of the playing and uh, the area on the east side of the building because we basically shrunk um, or shortened uh, that wing that had the extended learning area as well as the community room. Um, Yes, we are on time with schedule. I saw Ms. Jackson uh, answered that for us in the chat. We are still uh, planning to be on schedule and working with um, Skanska certainly on making sure that that happens so that we can start in the new MacArthur in January. Um, there was a question about furniture savings. And so um, furniture is one of those things, there's different ways uh, we can procure it or we can use other furniture. Um, and so that has just been one of the things we've been talking about as a savings um, potentially bundle it with another project uh, because it's not something you need right at the start of the contract. It's not necessarily that something that needs to be a part of this contract. Um, so something we will be looking into. And I think that it, oh, and then there was a question and Erica, if you can help me on the um, grading impact of uh, stormwater runoff um, where the field is now. And I know we changed the grade to be a little bit more similar to how it is um, currently, but just if you could talk a little bit about some of the stormwater infrastructure that we have planned under the turf um, and just in general, how that will work. Sure, um, and if I'm understanding the question right, um, there have historically been some issues with, um, great, with the groundwater from the parking lot, that sort of thing into adjacent neighbors. Um, so the first thing is that, um, we have leveled out the playing field area. So right now the MacArthur uh, site slopes, it kind of has a crown in the middle of the parking and it slopes down towards Forest Park, uh, but also down towards the neighbor uh, and then down towards Janney's Lane. Right now the parking, the playing field is now a leveled space and it's designed with a slight uh, sort of slight tilt in and all of the groundwater that will come onto that field will actually fall into a gravel layer that we've placed under the field. So that water that's currently running off from the paved area will no longer go to the neighbor shards. It will go down into the, into the ground underneath of the playing field. So first off, that's a drastic reduction in the amount of groundwater that would, would lean towards the north and the east of the site. Uh, but in addition, we have a small sloped area from the um, from the playing field that goes down towards the neighbors. And we've created um, a swale, which is basically a, a little uh, dip in the way the, the ground is uh, formed and a little bit of um, stone and a, a drain that will connect into existing stormwater management system that's there. So that anything that is coming from the small sliver that still remains, which is about it's somewhere between 12 and 14 feet from the neighbor's property to where our fence line for our playing field is. Um, and that area will be planted, so it will do some of its own absorption, but whatever runs off in a heavy storm will go into this yard inlet and connect into uh, a system that's currently there on that northeast corner of the site. Does that, does that get what you were looking at? I didn't look at the chat yet. So. I, think, I think that was uh, pretty thorough. But okay. when we go through the um, advisory group members, we can uh, make sure to clarify if we didn't answer their question. Um, sorry, two, two more. Uh, and Joe, maybe these are more for you, but how far beyond the property line will uh, fencing be at the forest park and school boundary? Um, I think we would put it at the property line. Um, we obviously can have that conversation if it makes sense to uh, pull it beyond the property line. Obviously, there would be approval needed. And then the other thing we would likely do is post some signage uh, within the trailway just to make sure that individuals who are on it understand that it act is actually closed uh, at these particular areas. So hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, I think that's good. And then um, 
when, so I know we kind of gave the month outlines, but removing the slab and how long that takes, when do we think that'll happen? So uh, unfortunately, the, the building actually comes down pretty quick. That occurs very fast. What unfortunately takes the longest is the slab removal on the foundations. Um, the overall duration of the demolition is anywhere between two to two and a half months. Um, and I'm thinking the slab removal and foundation removal is likely going to occur over a period of about four to five weeks. Um, again, as we bring the, the demolition contractor on board, we'll be able to fine tune that, but that's uh, been my experience about four to five weeks ish um, for that slab removal and foundation removal. But Joe, in the past, um, how have you guys kind of worked with community members? Um, that area is such a small area and houses are around. Um, how have you guys worked with community members as far as like a time um, limit? Like, you know, you only start work removing that slab at a certain, you know, morning periods to, to allow families to kind of get up. Um, how have you done that in the past? Yes, it's actually it's somewhat interesting. I mean, it's definitely conversations we can have and work around. Um, I don't want to necessarily um, um, commit to anything at the moment until we have those conversations, but uh, let me say it this way. The last uh, school job we had done, um, we had actually taken down the building, removed the foundations um, within a matter of 15 feet from the adjacent school uh, that we were building. We built a new building, demolished the old one 15 feet away from the school property while school was in session. So there's no doubt in my mind we can make it work and, um, and come to a reasonable resolution or solution on it. And then it looks like the last question we have is where do we anticipate staff to park given local street parking restrictions? So we anticipate, Ms. Porter, that they will park in the parking garage um, it, where, that will be built for them. In addition, the, street, the parking along um, Janney's Lane is open for uh, staff to park there um, as well. Uh, so that's how we anticipate addressing that. I'll now go through, so we're gonna give each, like last time, give each advisory group member um, some time to just have comments, questions. Certainly you guys can uh, mull this over and send us in questions um, and uh, we'll go from there. I'll go through my participant list and just um, name you off in the order I see you. So uh, Ms. Jackson, you are first on my list. Thank you. I'm I'm okay right now with the questions I've asked about the the grading and the turf and the the groundwater and the parking for right now. Thank you very much. I will let you move along. All right, great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fister. You're next. All right. Thank you for the update. Um, looks like you guys have been working hard, so appreciate all the the work. Um, is the geothermal system included in this design right now? Because I know that the the solar was not originally. So is geothermal necessary to be net zero, and is is that included in the budget and the design? Geothermal is included, uh, Eric, Erica. It's included as part of our full project and has been since the beginning. Erica, do you want to offer anything else? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's it's been the basis of design for the project. So, uh, yeah, we're not going to be changing the mechanical system at this point. Cool. No, I just wanted to make sure it was already in there and we wouldn't have a budget surprise. Um, yeah, no, so, no, it's always been in. Yeah. Cool. Um, solar, are, have we considered uh, third parties for um, you know outsourcing the solar so that we're not doing it so that we don't have to have that expertise or that maintenance headache or that cost even because you could do a flip on it? Yes, so that's definitely something we're exploring with our mechanical engineer and the team looking at third party potentially, um, you know, being able to front the capital cost to maintain it and what, you know, and, and us kind of releasing our um, uh, utilities to them. Uh, so that's something we will be exploring. We did include it in the budget, though, uh, and just in case that's something we're not able to work through. Uh, so trail access, um, it, so it didn't occur to me till now that during this whole construction project, so it sounds like um, demolition should wrap up within six months, give or take. And then we have a little bit less than 18 months, give or take for the construction, if my math is right. So for about two years, trail access is gonna be down. Um, I didn't know if, yeah, right now it doesn't matter, but 
uh, I have been told that there are a lot of TC Williams students that they cut through there, but there are also a lot of community members. Uh, so is that that area just going to be shut off, no access there for two years? Joe, you could stop me at any point, but um, so there's potential that at points of the project, we'll be able to provide that access back um, it, to the extent that we can, but certainly we'll have to communicate um, when we know it will be cut off uh, to our TC students as well as other students and neighbors in the area. Um, but it's something we would look to hopefully bring that connection back up as soon as we can. All right, thanks. Two, two small ones and then I'm done. Uh, window treatment. So I noticed that uh, there are a couple things that when we talk about cost cutting, um, if we're having to go as far as consider uh, used furniture for a new building, um, some things like the bump out around the window for the on the third floor for the southeast corner. Yeah, some of these things, these features, these design elements have a cost to them. Um, some of the, the window treatments on a lot of the windows actually and yeah, you know, it adds up. It's ten thousand dollars here and there. Uh, where, yeah, you want the outside to look nice, but at the same time, I want to have furniture. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, have we looked at that? Because it doesn't look like we've really scaled back some of the the design elements on the outside, but we are trying to scale back uh, extended learning areas, and that that concerns me a little bit. So we have looked at window treatments. One of the things, um, because the windows are on the exterior of the building and kind of a function of the design, they are part of the DSUP approval. And so we've certainly worked with the city on um, looking at any of those, seeing, seeing if some of that can be taken out. But um, as far as how planning and zoning and the city sees it, that's kind of a part of the design and not necessarily something that could be easily changed. Um, but if we do have to get to that point, it's something that we can discuss with them, um, even if it's in, you know, maybe places where it's less visible or uh, something like that, that we're able to do. Um, as far as the extended learning areas, I would just say, as uh, Erica Lehman said, we had more extended learning areas um, than the program called for. And so that's why we felt pretty comfortable taking those out. Yeah, but I will say that like times like now, it'd be great to have extra space. But that's, yeah. Um, and last one, um, mentioned the uh, removal of some sentimental items. Uh, there's been a, a movement of potentially trying to get some uh, old bricks so that we could have a memorial such that um, prior students, families and such uh, could get access to them. It could even be a fundraiser or, or some kind of community outreach. Um, would love to be able to do that. So I just want to put that on everyone's radar. If that's a possibility, please. And I'm done. Thank you. Yes, we, and we've heard about the bricks and um, we're, we're talking about that, just how that might work uh, if we are able to do that. Thank yeah, you. In Phil. the past, and let me, let me interject real, real quick, Erica. Okay. In the past, we have been able to sal salvage those bricks, um, it, you know, depending on how, what the quantity is. Um, I mean, that would be something to consider, but, you know, salvaging, you know, 100 bricks usually isn't a problem. Now, if we're talking 1,000, that's where it becomes somewhat problematic and time consuming. Uh, for our operators to kind of sort and separate that stuff. If it's a, like I say, a hundred or, you know, 50, something like that, we, we should be able to do that with relative ease. Um, and then the other thing I just want to talk a bit, a bit about briefly um, is that trail access. Um, I don't want to close off the conversation entirely, but it would be, uh, it would be a pretty safe, uh, significant safety concern um, if we had to maintain access to the trails, considering they're on the backside of the site, especially with, uh, supportive excavation going on, obviously demolition, structural still going up. Um, I think there's a big safety concern with trying to maintain that. I understand it's a primary egress for certain individuals um, to get to TC Williams, but again, from a safety perspective, I think that needs to be, uh, you know, consider a little bit further before we really make that commitment that we can, you know, try to open it up early. But again, it, these are all good conversations and good, good discussions. Yeah, and I completely appreciate that. And I believe the back wall of the building is literally on the property line. So your construction fence probably has to go even further. So yeah, I think it's just a, um, a community awareness, letting people know that this is coming and, but completely appreciate the safety. So thank you. Um, okay, Dana, you're next on my list. I'm okay, uh, no questions. Thanks for the, thanks for the update. Okay. Um, Elliot? Had a couple things uh, to mention. Thanks for the presentation. The trail is an issue because I think that if the um, 
trail is cut off if all access points to Jenny's lane are cut off. I think it uh, represents pretty big safety issues. Um, if you're going through the park from other uh, parts of the park and then end up there and can't get out, it's kind of disorienting. And I was wondering whether it's possible to establish um, a five or 10 foot easement on the east side of the property to maintain access through to the existing trail um, at certain points during construction um, in order to maintain that access way through. And if you can't, community needs to be really well aware of what the problems, what, what the situation will be, when it might be open, when it's gonna be closed, how to take alternative paths through the park. So that's one. Um, if the uh, field is converted to natural turf, will you still be able to do the stormwater management program underneath it? So that's a so question. I'll take that. Um, yeah, so we did review that with the city and that is that is still the plan. So um, we would we would go through with that same stormwater management approach with a with a synthetic turf or a natural turf. Yeah, I'm hoping the synthetic turf can remain. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think everyone is it's hard to maintain that natural turf yeah, over the long different. haul because we have a lot of students on it, but it's right. on the we have to have those alternates. So. And then the third question is the canopy removal, if that is removed because of cost considerations, would there be any design modifications to the facade or you just take it off and that's it? Yeah, so to be a little more clear on that particular alternate, um, Right now, the base that one is actually an ad alternate. So the first set of sketches I was showing without the canopy is the base bid. So what the the project is assuming will go through, um, and then the added canopy is an ad alternate. So we'll take that if we're able to get through all of the rest of the you know budgetary issues and we still have funds, we would we would put the bigger canopy. Um, what we did as we went through the city approvals process is we did include alternates so that we have an approval to go forward with either scenario. Um, and so we sort of made them aware as we were going through this process and it's continuing to carry through our final site plan reviews, et cetera, that we have this kind of piece in there that's gonna go one, one, one way or the other depending on what happens with budget. So, um, but the canopy is actually an ad alternate, not a deduct alternate. Okay, thank sense. you. All right, thanks, Elliot. Um, next, I have Jeanette. Uh, I think I actually gave all my questions to Elliot. Um, uh, I did have to, I think one additional comment about the Forest Park uh, connection is that there might be good to have a, some sort of detour map that gets put out for folks just to understand their different access points. Um, or, or even within the park to know where they shouldn't co go through. So that would be um, pretty helpful. Um, I may have missed this in the last presentation, but with the, the entrance of the school, I see the, the larger green space, was there still any consideration given to a little bit more of a gathering opportunity in that area versus it being um, green just right up to the doors? Um, I mean, we do have we do have canopy and and sidewalk there in front. I think if that's um, I'm not sure exactly what you um, were talking about there. Um, you know, our understanding is folks sort of gather, you know, gather in the front there, but also gather kind of under the tree in the green area. So um, I guess we think of of both that lawn and the side sidewalks and under the um, under the canopy because we have sort of a relatively long uh, canopy from the drop-off area. So any of those will be places that people can gather at pick up and drop off. All right, thank you. Thanks for the presentation and the updates. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, next, I have Kelly. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Thank you. Oh, I realize I still have a funny background. <laughs> I was doing some family Zoom over Thanksgiving. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I um, I wanted to, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're still on track to meeting the deadline of when we're going to be moving back into the building. Uh, it's, um, But are, are you concerned that how much catching up are we going to have to do? Because it appears, at least based on the timeline that's presented on the ACPS website, that we're at least four months behind at this point um, on construction. Because on the website, it says that construction would have started in September. So I guess what I'll say is that construction activities have started. So we've started some of the utility disconnect. Um, you know, we've made sure stuff is out of the building. So some of that has started. It's it's not visible. Um, and we are still working through the contract. Um, it has taken us a little bit longer than we wanted to for util utility disconnects. Um, so those are some of the things we're still working through. But ultimately, with uh, the permitting schedule, working very closely with Skanska, um, with all the city partners, we're, we're uh, making sure that the schedule, we're still able to meet that timeline. And what is ultimately going to be the communications plan to let, uh, I mean, aside from us reaching out to our networks and stuff like that, but letting everybody know that that's the, that we're still on schedule, the timeline's still on schedule, because I think that if there's a delay getting into MacArthur when we've all been out of the school building since March, there's not going to be any patience uh, within the community if we get delayed of when we're supposed to be re-entering the school. Yeah. I completely agree. Um, as we, uh, we have a community meeting next week, we're hoping to establish as construction gets going, we'll be able to establish kind of a regular rhythm um, of updates to make sure uh, that we're keeping everybody up to date. I think, you know, to be honest, the team has been really focused on this, these budget constraints and getting the cost to where it needs to be. And once um, we're, uh, the contract is finalized and we're in construction full swing, um, with Skanska, I think it'll be uh, much clearer and um, we'll be able to provide the community those regular updates um, to make sure we're staying on schedule. Okay. And I think it would be really helpful. I mean, I know, um, I mean, I've, I've listened into some of the school board meetings where you've had some of the CIP meetings where you've had some updates on what's happening, but I think it would be important to also get that on the web, on um, the, uh, some of these updates up on the website too, for people who may not even listen to this recording, because if you look at the timeline on the, it's, on the actual website, it's a little confusing. And a lot of people have approached me saying, hey, when's this building supposed to be coming down? And we said, well, we thought it was actually going to be already um, coming down earlier than what's planned at this point. Uh, and then a number, a number of other comments I think would be helpful to share with the community of why could we not have um, advance the timeline even faster since we've been out of the building since March. We've had an empty building that we could have been doing more with to move faster on this project. That's helpful. We'll make sure we work. And with I, know it's, I know it's like permit and timeline, you know, permit timeline and, uh, you know, working with the city and stuff like that, but that's information that you still need to be able to communicate. Yep. We will work on that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next I have Christina. Hi, um, I guess I just really want to echo what Kelly just said. Um, I know just she just went, but I think you really need to be clear with the community about um, what exactly has been happening, not just that stuff has been happening, but that what has happened in the bu building to date. Um, you know, it, it, as she pointed out that it still says September, everybody's like, well, it says the end of September, we haven't been in school since March, what's happening, why aren't, why aren't they in there? Um, and so I think you just have to really have a communications plan and be extremely clear in the community meeting next week um, about what has been happening, what exactly um, the hurdles that we still have to go through and the hoops in terms of permits etc um where we are on all of that and um what exactly i think if he can go through joe can go through that timeline a little bit more in detail um i think it would be very helpful so that's all i had thank you um next i have lisa Sorry, before Lisa starts, I just wanted to say something really quickly to the team because I have to log off to get to my next meeting at seven o'clock. Um, I just wanted to thank the advisory team uh, for, for your insight and your input. I've been able to listen in on this 
uh, information and uh, keeping abreast of everything that's happening with us. Our team, you know, hats off to them for working extremely hard under these conditions. I mean, you got to think of the fact we have a global pandemic happening. We have uh, our transitional planning at school on and off for the school division um, and all of the other projects that we have a part of our CIP, which by the way, is the largest CIP probably in the history of Alexandria City Public Schools um, and, and the city of Alexandria, I'm sure. Uh, and we still have the same size team. So I just wanna say thank you all for the hard work that you continuously do. Um, and advisors, uh, thank you all for your candor um, and your questioning throughout this process because it does allow us to make um, you know, the product and the delivery of our work even better um, because of your input. So we do appreciate that. I know that um, Erica probably mentioned this earlier today, but we are recording these. We want people to stay informed. You know, This is another way to stay abreast of what's happening and some of the things that we grapple with at the advisory level. Um, so we're recording these and posting these. Please encourage people to listen to them. We're gonna to try to be as transparent as we possibly can be. You know, And if you give us input, we will do um, you know, for the most part, if it's doable, um, what, what you all ask to try to help people stay informed um, with this work. So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you all. And I'm gonna to go to my TC Williams PTA meeting next. So uh, have a good night. Thanks, Dr. Hutchings. Uh, Lisa, have you next? Uh, so thank you guys. I, first of all, I really, really appreciate the update and for answering all of my earlier questions. Um, I just want to, a couple comments, just to reiterate things that uh, other people said. Um, Forest Park, um, you know, that access being cut off is going to impact a number of kids. It's going to impact, and just to bring it up um, on a broader perspective, it's going to impact transportation too, uh, which probably will still be an issue when these kids get back into school um, next year. More kids will be taking the bus if they can't you know, do that quick walk because the walk arounds on either side are a mile and a half as opposed to half a mile through the park. Um, on the, uh, to add to that and just something to keep in mind, please, again, I want to emphasize people said give a map or give some kind of direction to people who are coming through and um, from TC back into the neighborhood. Um, you're probably going to have kids coming after sport practices, which are pretty late at night and usually around dusk um, and maybe a little after. And having them end up at the back of MacArthur confused is probably not going to be a very safe um, or good all around occurrence um, for these kids. So just if we can do our best to um, direct people when they get stuck back there, that would be a very good thing. And to help out the students who are going to be, you know, obviously increasing their walking commutes or needing transportation um, as a result of this. Um, the other one I wanted to just say is um, if we could get um, repeated updates for the community on the status of that parking garage. Um, obviously, potentially having a larger number of people parking on the street if that bumps out far enough, um, because we're actually maybe, I don't remember how many are on the top lot, um, but I just want to emphasize, I don't want to have MacArthur and increased staff and teachers at, or uh, parents at MacArthur are now competing against the BI kids, which is probably where you're going to end up. Um, and they start earlier. Um, on the, I had one question about the the site plan. I think it's, um, I'm sorry, it's number. It's it's the it's what the um, twelve I think it is, um, and then you have a view from the northeast. Um, that one, okay, that one back up there. Are Sorry, you looking for the left. site plan? And not the site plan. It's it's on the um it's on the uh, PowerPoint on number twelve, I think. Uh, that one. Sorry. Okay. It's on the north right there. What is that on the top left hand um, picture? What is that under the bump out? Just out of curiosity. Uh, it's a bioretention uh, uh box. So okay. it collects stormwater. That makes sense. Okay. I was just wondering, I didn't know if it was some kind of a strange thing. And I was hoping that area could be used for um, seating or if there would be some kind of seating for shaded seating for people who's having their kids play or watching games, but obviously yes, bioretention so is more important. So I get that. Yeah, no, and actually it will be made so that the wall edge could be used sort of as a seat. It will be kind of at seat height. So we were thinking okay. that would be a spot that people could kind of you know, gather a little bit in the shade there, but it will have 
you're not really seeing the plants, but there will be some plants in there. Um, so it's just one of the bio, we have a bunch of them now kind of surrounding the building, um, just needed to add some additional bioretention. Okay, thank you. That actually mm -hmm. makes a lot more sense now. Um, the last question I had, or I had two more questions, sorry. Um, are there any more permitting hurdles that you guys have to overcome at this point? Are we all set on that front? Or is this the ACPS all set? So um, there are more permits that we have to go through, uh, a few more. So um, the next one being, there's the, it seems like they're never ending, but they're not necessarily, um, the, the next one is kind of the demolition permit. You need certain things prior to that, including um, some of the asbestos abatement, stuff like that. Um, so those, we're working very closely with the city to get them out as soon as possible. Um, and then working through the uh, DLR group is working through the final site plan submissions, making sure we have all city comments um, up front and uh, are able to address them as soon as possible so that hopefully we can get move to building permit pretty uh, quickly in the next calendar year. So yes, there are more permits and then we'll have trades permits throughout the project, um, but it's something where uh, we feel like we're working very closely um, with everyone who needs to be involved on those. Okay, thank you. And then um, my other, I'm sorry, I just said two quick other things. One is just a request. Is there any way you could add a view from if you're standing at Janie's Lane of the building? I know you have an aerial view, but there's none that's directly like from Janie's Lane looking at the school. They're all at angles. Um, and I didn't see like that, the one area at the bottom, if there's one that actually faced straight on from the street level, it would just be nice to see that because the top one doesn't quite get you there and the other ones don't quite get you there. So you're asking for Just like to the clarify the this view from the south is as if you're standing on the opposite curb of Janie's Lane. Um, okay. I did crop the street out just because it's a lot of uh, uh, but that this is a, if you're standing on the on the opposite curb of Janie's Lane and looking over um, it's not showing the entire length of the building. So we could uh, put in something that shows the entire length of the building. This kind of I cropped out the west I end. That. Yeah, that might help. Okay, sure. Um, and then the only other thing I want to emphasize again is construction um, and communicating constantly, um, you know, in terms of um, the uh, the one part where they said they coordinated with the school, that's very good to hear. And that's very good for the community to know that, that they were able to, you know, do majority of the construction with a school in session, but it's easier to communicate with one school than it is with a lot of people who right now are doing distance or virtual learning and working from home unanticipated during this construction process. So I think it would just help the neighbors to get constant updates about what's happening. And that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Next, I have Ms. Lorber. Thank, thank you, Erica. Terrific update. Thank you, everybody. I actually just had one small question. Uh, throughout, the, throughout the planning and everything, I, I recall that members of the community have asked a lot about having a track. And so I wondered if that presentation today, when you showed us the edges around the field, is that the answer to, the, will that sort of be the track? That, that folks have been asking for? Yes. Uh, so that's why it's oriented that way. We changed some of the curves. It's not track material like it would be for a high school or middle school, but it is. it has the feeling of a track. And we've talked about potentially putting like mile marker, or whatever, you know, kind of signage like that um, on it. The only, I just wanted to add that I appreciate everybody. You know, for me, the most useful thing is listening to everybody else's comments. I mean, that's really uh, very helpful. So thanks everybody for your insight, your comments. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lyle. I'm good, Erica. My All questions right. have been answered, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Gore, I believe you're our last one. Thank you, I have no comments or questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Erica, this is Amy Jackson. I, I put a question in the chat concerning the Dominion disconnect. Do we have a date set? Uh, we don't. It should be soon. Um, they've gone through some design and 
uh, need kind of authorization from us um, to proceed um, on, on some of the work that they need to do. It should be soon, but we don't have an exact date. Okay, because a couple of weeks ago when we did the school board city council meeting, it, we brought it up then also not for an exact date, but that we it would be soon. So I don't want two more weeks to pass and then it's been a month and we still don't have a date with Dominion. So if there's anything I need to do to, to help, then please let me know. Absolutely. Uh, I think it, it should be, we should have a date soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Erica, do you want to stop sharing your screen just so I can see everybody? Okay. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. So as we stated previously, this was um, videoed live so people could watch it, but it also is recorded. And once um, we're able to, we will post it on the website. I will certainly, uh, I've heard you about um, the website and needing it to uh, be updated. And so we'll, we will certainly work uh, with our communications team to make sure that that happens. But uh, thank you all, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you, Erica. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Erica. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.